Kota Tunis Malaysia yang terkenal dan disayangi Dato Lat. Lat is a remarkable Malaysian artist. His cartoons have changed the way Malaysians see their world. At a time when it was taboo to comment on politics, Lat redefined the rules with his humor. Humor bring about closeness among people. People laugh, but only after some time. Then only people realize there is some message. Lat's success is rooted in childhood memories of his kampong, the Malay village at the heart of his culture. His simple message also connects him with people a world away. Here is a blooming of a great cartoonist. Transcended the kampong, it came into the Malaysian city and moved on to the international arena. You know. At crucial moments, Lad's path has crossed with people who have believed in him. Each time, he's pushed his art further, inspired by the spirit of his Malay kampong. I'm from the kampong, so I would draw about kampong. No matter how far you go, I'm still a kampong boy at heart. Yeah. Lad's been driven by a simple dream to tell stories with pictures he loves to draw. He never set out to be a political satirist, but his need to express himself set him on the path that gave Malaysians a new way of looking at themselves and their leaders. His journey has taken him to the limelight and back. His disarming sense of humor has made him an icon for Malaysians and endeared him to many in the region. But his heart has never left where his art began, the village or kampong where he was born some 50 years ago, where the regulars at the tea stall are friends he has known all his life. <laughs> The kampong, close to the town of Ipoh in northern Malaysia, is more than just home for Lat. It embodies all the old-fashioned values that have guided him all his life. I have the kampong in me. I go everywhere with it, you know. I can go to New York City and I can talk about art with people there. But I'm still from the kampong, and I still represent my people from the kampong. Although his life was to take many turns, his kampong always remained at the heart of his cartoons. The first seed was planted when a chubby child, Mohammed Noor Khalid, was nicknamed Lut, or Little Round One. Just the sort of humor the kampong folks expected of his father, a man they called the village jester, who taught his young son to see the funny side of life. In the house, we would play hide and seek. You know? My father and my sister and me, he's a big fellow, <laughs> hide behind the cupboards, hide behind the uh, mosquito net. <laughs> I don't know how, how that could be, you know. Uh, it was funny. Very funny, and uh, so much so that, uh, you know, when I was walking around the kampong and somebody says, who is that? Oh, that is uh, Khalid's son. And uh, some of these old folks will laugh because the mere mention of my dad, uh, they would laugh because they, they would know that this guy, maybe this guy too will turn out to be a joker. Memories of those early years stayed with Lot and later in life, he paid tribute to his kampong days in a book and an animation series. His stories tell of days filled with simple pleasures of a kampong childhood, games of marbles, swimming in the river, and the adventures of a determined young prankster. 
I don't ask him to do that or that this huh, and don't that and do this. I just leave it to himself. Whatever you want to do, you do. My mother chased me, you know, all over the kampung for playing in the swamp, naked, uh, riding the sampan. And uh, I said, oh, I'm going to die. Before she could get hold of me, you know, I escaped. I fled and ran all over the kampung. She ran after me and I was caught. But there was another side to the playful boy in Lat's cartoons. Young Lat was shy, and in his quieter moments, he discovered he had a gift that delighted his father. He would bring back rolls of paper from his office. <laughs> big, big rolls. And uh, he said, he would throw on the floor. Draw. I drew on the floor at a very early stage. You know, on the wooden floor, on pieces of paper, and then the, the drawings were about what I saw. Usually, I saw in magazines, illustrations or advertisements, colorful ones, advertisement, uh, chocolate advertisement, you know, kids and chocolate. Uh, but I was in the kampung. Yeah. Chocolates were far away. <laughs> were, uh, and so, I just drew. And you must remember, drawing is like singing. It's like music. You're born to be doing it. Lot's father wanted his son to believe in his gift. He encouraged a bashful Lot to draw for an audience. My dad would say to relatives who are about to leave after the visit, hold on, hold on, we'll draw something for you. <laughs> uh, you know, get, get a piece of paper, draw, draw, you know. So I, I couldn't stand that. Not because I didn't like it, but because I was embarrassed. Embarrassed to draw in front of uh, these people, these old relatives. Hold on, hold on, don't go. They are all about to, you know, bought their cars and leave, but no, no. Lat will draw something for you. He's good at drawing, and you see him draw. Draw, draw. I would draw. You know, and they would look, forced to look. <laughs> at that time, Lat's talent was seen as just a hobby. When he was eight, his kampong days came to an end. His father decided to send his son to an English boarding school in the nearby town of Ipoh. Little did Lot realize how this move would change his life. <laughs> As the bashful kampong boy settled into school life in Ipo, it didn't take long for his friends and teachers to realize he was no ordinary student. He himself was not unaware of being perceived as quite the young artist about town. He tucked half of the shirt inside, he tucked half of the, half of the shirt is outside, not being tucked. Um, the way that he walk, he did, he, he wear a white shoe with the socks and a, a shorter long pants, purposely to, this, to, to expose the, the, the ankle. I considered myself as an artist because the friends in the class referred to me as an artist. Whenever I drew in class, there'd be the teacher standing behind looking at my work or friends coming to look. You could tell already that there's something special there. His talents may well have remained a schoolboy's etchings, but he was coming into his own at a special time for artists in Malaysia. It was the late 1950s. The British had just left. Malaysians celebrated their independence the country was abuzz with poets, writers, and filmmakers. This heady period also threw up many professional comic artists, one of whom was Raja Hamza. His stories of Malay legends, folk heroes, and swashbuckling warriors helped a generation of Malaysians connect with their roots. 
It was Raja Hamza who inspired young Lat's ambition. Through Raja Hamza, Lat caught a glimpse of his own future. He decided to become a professional comic artist. I wanted to be like Raja Hamza whenever I look at his work. When I went to the newsstand, I would look at his comics. You know, you cannot take down the comic because you can just peep. You know, it's hung, you know. If you take down, you have to buy. You know? uh, and then I look, I saw his signature, I saw his drawings. His drawings were good, really good drawings. Lat was determined to succeed, just like his hero. Not even in his teens, he set his heart on getting a comic published. It was not easy. He drew relentlessly, but to no avail. There were many comics that I did, uh, but the, the rejection uh, continued to come. You know, the letters accompanying the rejection, you know, telling me the quality was bad. But Lat believed in himself. His ambition to be a Raja Hamza kept him going. Lat was just 13 when he drew a comic about a story set in town, but whose characters were inspired by the people from his kampong. Lat called it The Adventures of Three Friends, Tiga Sakawan. It's all very dandy and bino kind of style, and it was accepted. You know, I was paid 25 ringgit for it. For a 13-year-old boy, there was a lot of money. He gave me ten dollars and he asked me to go home but he stayed at the town to enjoy himself with his brothers Raja Hamza inspired young Lat to get his first comic published it was to set him on the path towards becoming a professional cartoonist Tiga Sakawan was just the beginning now Lat could pursue his ambition with new comics about school friends, family, and ghosts that had scared him as a kid. Lat was now Ipo's young artist about town. I found that I was already on the same league with uh, someone like Raja Hamza, my childhood hero. And I thought that I already joined his club and uh, the people that were members of his club, all the other artists. It was a big thing for me. 1964. Around the time Lat was entering the professional world of Malay comics, another world was opening up. He was still at school, exploring his many talents, like in the school band, where he once played the flute, and where he's a patron today. His visits to his alma mater remind him of another guide, a school teacher who gave him his first lessons into a world very different from his kampong. It was through her, Lat first engaged the English-speaking world. She was fierce. She looked fierce. She had these butterfly glasses. She had this uh, big beehive hairdo. She was carrying a cane most of the time. And she was angry most of the time. Siapa boleh beritahu persamaan di antara kehidupan semut dan manusia? These little boys had just left their parents, their home, to join this multiracial school. And uh, my heart went out to them. And I uh, sort of took them into my own uh, hands as my own children. In just two years, Mrs. Hugh planted in him ideas Lat would tap into later in his life, when he was ready to think beyond Ipo and the world of Malay comics. I think it taught him to be uh, more um, receptive of others, of others' ideas. Learning of English, it has sort of provided them with a bridge uh, which connected them to with their, their, their wonderfully rich culture in the kampong to a much larger world 
and learning English has helped them to uh, cope with the people in this larger world. For now, the Kampong boy was delighted to enter the world of Elvis and the Beatles. But he was buying into Western popular culture of the 60s with money earned from his Malay comics, where his heart still remained. Although he dabbled with Western influences, he soon came to a realization. Lot, the cartoonist, would have to develop a style he could distinctly call his own. The late afternoons, you know, the relatives, neighbors, and my father would gather in, in the veranda, just sit down and uh, talk. Surely they, they would comment on my comics when it came out. And uh, they commented that it looked like Western characters, like Bino and Dandy characters. It didn't look uh, local, it didn't look Malay. The houses didn't look like uh, our houses, you know. So one of them told me, why don't you draw what you see around you? You see the chicken coop behind your house? Why don't you draw that? You, every day you feed the chicken. You can draw that. from his kampong folks gave Lat a fresh perspective. It reconnected him with the village where he grew up. Soon the going-ons in his kampong became a new comic strip. The simple story of a man called Si Mamat was picked up by a local Malay newspaper and became an immediate hit. By the time he finished school in Ipoh, Lat was as famous as any 16-year-old could be. The Si Mamat stories had won him fans, even in the capital, Kuala Lumpur. My mind was always Kuala Lumpur. That was the place. My friends knew I was going there. It's better to go to Kuala Lumpur and pursue this drawing career. These days, Lat drives to Kuala Lumpur only for work. But 30 years ago, he could not wait to live here. The success of Si Mamat gave Lat the confidence to believe he had a career ahead of him. He wanted to do more than just contribute an occasional strip. His ambition was to draw full-time, like his hero, Raja Hamza. The Kampong boy instinctively found his way into a neighborhood not too different from the one he left behind. Kampong Baru, or the new Kampong, was the first stop for migrants, and it became his home. Anchored once again in a village, Lat was ready to take on the big city. I felt that now I'm right there. You know, this town is full of artistic people. You know, this town is where all the big writers were. And then the, this town uh, have newspapers, magazines, as uh, the TV stations, you know. And you a lot of young people there, so eager to work. And this is the place to, uh, to work. Mm. Lot headed to the newspaper where Raja Hamza worked, but the company didn't need another artist. Instead, he was offered a job as a reporter, but in their English daily, the New Straits Times. This unexpected turn of fate would send him back to the English-speaking world. The editor, Samad Ismail, had heard of the young Epo artist, but he felt to be a good cartoonist, Lat needed to be a journalist. As a reporter, you know, you meet people. You go to courts, you know, you cover crime. So you're more closer to, you know, so 
you can feel the pulse of the of uh, of society. You see, you must familiarize yourself with you know your environment. You know, like uh, it's not no use sitting in an office and draw cartoons. You know, you don't get anything. It was a question of survival. I had to be a reporter because I wanted to continue going on. I had to keep on going on. No more Ipoh now, Kuala Lumpur. I got to work there. My dad uh, had already uh, went on what we call a medical board because he was sick. So he had to quit. And uh, I, as the, the number one son, had to, you know, really help the family. Left with no choice, Lat hit the crime beat. But his heart still remained in the kampong and in the world of Malay comics. He was stuck in the shadow of Raja Hamza. After three years in the city, he was nowhere close to realizing his ambition of becoming a professional artist. He wasn't even making it as a reporter. My writing didn't improve because I have a feeling I didn't like this being nosy, you know, asking too many questions uh, at people I don't know, asking the wrong questions, maybe sometimes at the wrong time, you know. House on fire, you meeting the victims, meeting uh, accident victims in hospitals. I said, there are ways of doing it. There are people who can do it, and I'm not one of them. In a moment of frustration, Lat decided to quit, not knowing this would set him on the path of realizing his dream. I resigned in a letter and I even told the crime desk people that I'm resigning. You have no fears anymore because I'm leaving, you know. I was not doing a good job anyway. But his boss, Samad Ismail, refused to accept the resignation. He was determined to keep the promising young artist. It is better for him to stay in, in, in this because, he, because there is no chance for, because there are other plans for him, you see. Not just a reporter. A reporter just to expose him, you know. Lad had no idea about such plans. He felt trapped. The world of Malay comics was closed. And now, Samad forced him to deal with the English-speaking world. Back on the crime beat, Lad was desperate to be published again. At this turning point, he witnessed a moment which inspired him to connect his kampong with the English-speaking world. I as a crime reporter, was stationed at the hospital. I noticed that uh, the Malay boys, the Muslim boys, were circumcised in a much simpler manner. Uh, not like during my time, you know. So these boys would come on a Saturday with uh, just, uh, you know, their shirt, trousers and on sarong, holding on sarong, and then the, they will go through the uh, the minor surgery and uh, by early afternoon they are back home. I said, wow, during my time we had a huge kampung affair which lasted two weeks. You know, you had to rest, lie down on the, on the floor for two weeks. Lat was confident he had a winner. He went ahead and drew his circumcision ceremony the Basunat. Determined to reach an audience, Lat captioned his story in English and sent it to the Asia magazine in Hong Kong. I was working at night, the night shift. Uh, two guys came up and said, oh, your cartoon uh, came out in the Asia magazine. I said, wow. The latest Asia magazine would have my drawing, you know. I was very happy. That night, wow, I was just looking at the drawing. This is my first cartoon in English, and it's published in the Hong Kong by the 
South China Morning Post. When the car sent the sent me back to my house in PJ at that time, I didn't go back to sleep. I went to a park and just look. You know, sun was rising and I said, and this is it. I'm going to get involved totally in this. Lat soon received the offer he was waiting for. His editor, Samad Ismail, proposed creating a special column just for him. Lat was moving out of the shadow of Raja Hamza, beyond the universe of Malay comics. He would soon carve a new niche for himself, cartoons in English, inspired by the simple life around him. Today, Lot is a familiar face at the newsroom of the New Straits Times. Thirty years ago, the rookie reporter caused quite a stir. The morning after his circumcision cartoon was published, it caught the eye of the big boss himself, who was not even aware Lot worked for his paper. The chief editor of the Straits Times. Mr. Lee Siu Yi uh, said to Pak Samad, you know, who was his number two, uh, this, uh, this uh, fellow who draws this cartoon, we should employ him. You know? <laughs> Pak Samad said, yeah, he's here. And uh, he said, that's the guy, the boy with the hair. And uh, so I was called in. Uh, he said, uh, "Oh, you should have, uh, you should have given this to us." The turn of events pushed Samad Ismail to act fast. He had to make Lat a cartoonist or risk losing him to a rival. He gave the 23-year-old artist a chance to publish his cartoons on the editorial page, his very own column, the Scenes of Malaysian Life series. I became a new man, somebody who started something else. This cartoon has a different style. I was uh, totally an individual with this style. And I'm different from Raja Hamza, different from anybody, you know? So much so that uh, if somebody tried to compare me with some big names, even that, you know, would drive me crazy. I would say, please don't compare me with others because I would try to draw from what I see. In the Malaysian Life series, Lat drew what others couldn't see. He spotted humour in everyday life and he observed the idiosyncrasies of the different communities in Malaysia but with an insight and sensitivity uncommon for someone barely out of his teens. For the first time, a cartoonist was capturing a world Malaysians of all races could smile at, together. No mean achievement in 1974. Just five years earlier, Malaysia had been shaken by race riots. At the time Lot started his column, people were still sensitive to any discussion about race. His role, I think, is very important in Malaysia because Lot's cartoons, when one looks back, had this kind of a, um, healing you know, role. You know, he, it brought people together again. It's so free of uh, ethnic prejudices. It's so free of uh, parochial considerations, you know. Mm. He is able to project again and again a universalized humanity, you know. With the success of the Malaysian Life series, it all came together for Lut. His father gave him the gift of humor. Raja Hamza inspired his ambition. 
Mrs. Hugh opened up the world of multicultural Malaysia. His cartoons were the talk of town. Soon, they were even published as books. With their growing popularity, fans wanted to know more about the man behind them. Lat created his best-selling autobiographies, The Kampong Boy and The Town Boy. settling into his newfound fame when another world beckoned. Now, the newspaper bureaucracy wanted the cartoonist to have formal training. Lat, who had been drawing all his life, was sent to an art school in London. The four-month stint was his first time out of the country. It was an exposure he wasn't quite prepared for. St. Martin's School of Art was fun. It was an evening class. Figure drawing, you know, they were models sitting and we drew them. Uh, I hadn't seen naked women before. I mean, the foreign women, you know. At that time, it was tough. My palms were wet, you know. I was sweating. But being an astute observer, he was quick to pick up the one idea he instinctively knew would take his art further. I had uh, look at the, a good look at the editorial cartoons you know, in the UK and uh, realized that the editorial cartoonists would draw all sorts of uh, subjects. They could draw the prominent figures. They could even draw the Queen of England. They could draw uh, prime ministers uh, all over the world, you know, presidents and make fun of them, you know. At that time, Idi Amin was in the news, you know. So I said, oh, maybe when I go back, I should try this sort of thing. Maybe this is what the newspaper wanted me to see. But back home, the reality was somewhat different. Cartoons on Malaysian leaders were still a political minefield. It was one thing to draw circumcisions. Taking on politicians was something else. A simple sketch of a prime minister soon landed him in trouble with his chief editor, the late Li Siu Yi. Someone like Li Siu Yi would say, don't draw the prime minister, you know. The first time I drew Ton Raza, he called me in, he said, uh, you want to go to jail? <laughs> I don't know, he was joking, but that's what he said. You must be crazy, this is a prime minister, you know. Perturbed by Li Su Yi's rejection, Lat was determined to push the boundaries. He was confident he could be honest without causing offense. He decided to give it another shot. The country was waiting for the then Prime Minister Hussein On to decide on a pay rise for the civil service. Lat knew he had the makings of another winning cartoon. The Prime Minister then <coughs> was away in the Middle East. And he had to make a decision on a pay rise when he, uh, and he were to come back. But he was riding a camel back all the way from uh, Middle East, telling the camel to just slow down, you know, you got need time to think. Lat again faced the one man who had the final say on whether his first political cartoon could be published. And once again, he would test the patience of Li Siu Yi. He was a very careful, very careful man, you know. And he reads every piece of news before it goes into to, 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 to press. I was waiting for the reaction. How would uh, the chief editor look at it? Is he going to uh, shout at me or what? Then I was called in and uh, he looked uh, a bit baffled, <laughs> you know. Uh, and then the, he laughed, of course, and uh, he was referring to the features of uh, 
our prime minister and uh, to to a cartoonist it was a uh, you know a, a good face to draw um, so he you know he agreed to use it he because he he loved it Lot's humor won over Lee Siu Yi. It would also go on to change the way Malaysians see their world. I realized that, uh, you know, I was into bigger things because these were political cartoons that would be read by not just the ordinary crowd, but uh, by you know, those people higher ups. And uh, that was one important point in my life. I, I found out that I had to go towards an, another direction. Lat was now more than just an observer. He became a commentator. But Lat was always sensitive to the nuances of the Malay culture he grew up with. He was non-confrontational, even in criticism. This earned him the support of Malaysians and the respect of local politicians. Politicians uh, like to be drawn. You know, whether you criticize them or you make fun of them, they like to see their faces in the newspapers. You know, I've drawn the Prime Minister being handpacked. And uh, of course, I had relatives calling me up. Got relatives from here, from Ipoh. Uh, aren't you worried? You know, you drew that. No. In the Malay culture, you are not to crit you, you, you are allowed to criticize, but the way of the criticism you have to find another outlet. It used to be in the, in the forms of a pantone, which is a poetry. So it must be in the form of a, something symbolic. And Lat has got the talent, and he used that talent through a drawing that made people laugh, but only after some time. Then only people realize there is some message about it. Is your intention good or bad? So inside, it must be good, you know, good intention. You are not afraid. You know, but if you have bad intention, then you shouldn't draw. As Lart's political cartoons became popular, they even caught the attention of Kuala Lumpur's diplomatic community. The Germans, Americans, Japanese, all wanted Lart to comment on their societies in Malaysian newspapers. The Kampong Boy was now a jet set cartoonist. International awards and accolades followed. Lat inadvertently became an unofficial ambassador for his country. Here is the, the blooming of a, of, a, of a great cartoonist. He had transcended the Kampong, he'd come into the Malaysian city, looked at the cultural world of Malaysia, multi-ethnic world, and moved on to the international arena, you know. I was, uh, you know, famous, and then the people were treating me like a rock star. You know, I looked like a rock star myself, you know, with very long, I, we played music too. You know, so uh, suddenly I realized, you know, I would go into a certain place, uh, a restaurant or a room, and people would look, you know. In the beginning, of course, you feel good because you're a young man and you get attention. But it didn't take long before I, I said uh, I couldn't, I don't like this and I couldn't wait for things to become normal again. I got tired of him and I, I hope that it will go away. By now, Lat was married and a proud father of four. The years raising his young family were happy ones. They helped him cope with the pressures of fame. 
they also made him realize he may be losing touch with the younger generation of Malaysians. I was at that time growing older and I found that the younger readers, the younger crowd were into newer uh, approach in uh, cartoons. Lat once again decided to take up the challenge. He quit his job. This time, his editor Samad Ismail did not stop him. The time had come for Lat to move on. With a family to support, he wasted no time seeking new opportunities. One such successful project was his collaboration with the Malaysian satellite TV company Astro. His bestseller, Kampong Boy, became Malaysia's first award-winning animation series. Once again, the stories of his childhood returned to inspire and connect him to a new generation. The main reason to get into animation was to do this TV series that would appeal to the five, six, seven year olds. And by that time, all my readers were much older, and I felt that I should get in touch with the very young. You know, and uh, to get in touch with the very young, you needed, you need animation. You know, uh, lively, colorful, that's fantasy. But because they're, they're, shooting from, they're shooting on this now. Now an independent artist and entrepreneur, Lat was finally tapping the full potential of his talent. His cartoon characters were sought after by businesses who saw their value as icons to promote their image in Malaysia. Novel ways of featuring both Lot and his works became trendy. Para penonton, host rancangan Lot dan Aida, cartoonist Malaysia yang terkenal dan disayangi Dato Lot, bintang film digital Aida Marina. Dana. Given his success, it came as no surprise to many Malaysians when in 1994, Lat was awarded one of the nation's highest honours, the title of Dato, the equivalent of a knighthood. He had more than achieved his dream. He was an even greater success than Raja Hamza. Yet Lat was aware from his own experience that while he remained on the scene, it would be difficult for a new generation of cartoonists to emerge. Faced with this dilemma, Lot once again looked for answers. They would take him back to where it all began. At the height of his career, when he was just 46, Lot chose semi-retirement in Ipo, the quiet town of his teenage years. He still needs to work, but he does it quietly, so a new generation of cartoonists can continue his legacy. I had stayed in Kuala Lumpur for 27 years, from 1970 to 97. So, uh, it's it was time to give room to the younger crowd. In many ways, it's the best of both worlds. From the comforts of a home built just like the Kampong house he remembers from his childhood, Lat develops new projects and continues to be sought after by young artists from Kuala Lumpur, keen to tap his experience as they chart their own journeys. Being back has been good in many ways for Lot. In rediscovering his old town for his young family, he's trying to give his children the same carefree childhood that inspired him to achieve so much. I mean, being in Ipo, where I started as a cartoonist, as a young, very young cartoonist, brought back all those 
you know, feeling that I had when I was a beginner, you know, as a cartoonist. So I feel very good, you know, because many parts of Ipoh still hasn't changed. So it gives me uh, new energy, new energy to work. Although Lart's journey has brought him back to where he started, he has lost none of his ability to seize every opportunity that can take his art further. Fate has often put him on the path of those who believe in his dream. At every such encounter, Lart always reaches into the core of who he is and where he has come from to make his dreams come true. I'm from the Kampong, so I will draw about Kampong. No matter how far you go, I'm still a Kampong boy at heart. Yeah. Today, in his early 50s, the Kampong boy continues to touch those whose paths happen to cross his.